Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the City Club of Portland. Welcome to City Club and our Friday Forum. Today our topic is what's to eat, food safety from farm to fork. Before we begin, I have a few uh, uh, announcements of City Club business as usual. Um, next Friday, March 28th, City Club takes a first look at the May election ballot when we welcome to the podium Sam Adams and Nick Fish. Dr. T Peter Steinberger of Reed College will moderate a debate between these two contenders for City Council. You can make your reservations online at www.pdxcityclub.org or with one of the staff members here today. City Club's spring membership drive continues and we've been giving away prizes each week for, to new members. If you join the club today, we'll throw your name into a, uh, a raffle for 10 club seats to watch the Portland Beavers during the 2004 season. Pretty good. That's courtesy of PGE. You'll find membership information on each table, and you can even sign up uh, for automatic month monthly withdrawals from your checking account for the membership fee. Uh, next week, well, this week, uh, a mem uh, representative of the Oregon Agribusiness Council has brought a basket of Oregon goodies, and we're going to uh, be offering that uh, in a future week if you become a City Club member. But today, it's uh, tickets to the Portland Beavers. So think about signing up for City Club today. You can contact staff members who are here, or you can do it online. We're also in the middle of our City Club annual fund drive, and we have an important milestone to mark. As of this week, nearly 400 very generous contrib contributors have pushed our annual fund to over $100,000. So we're, we're getting close. We have $15,000 to, to uh, reach between now and July if we're going to keep the programs going as we have over this last year. So we can do it, but we need your help. So please consider making a contribution to the club's annual fund. There are envelopes on each table, or you can make a donation online again at www.pdxcityclub.org. Citizens Read, uh, this club's book discussion group, meets next Monday, or excuse me, meets next on Monday, March 29th at the Zimmerman Community Center, which is in the Pearl District. Mike Burton will moderate a discussion of Jewel Lansing's book, Portland, People, Politics, and Power. And if you'd like to read ahead, in April, the book group will be reading Richard Florida's The Rise of the Creative Class. And copies of both of those books are available today in the lobby. Uh, on March 30th, the club's new leaders council will, will uh, host a forum called Coming to America, which is the first of a two-part dialogue that looks at refugees in Portland. Check the bulletin or look at the website for more information about this and other new leaders council events. I'd like to make some introductions today. Um, Representative Greg Smith of Hepner, who's the executive director of the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, is here. Thanks for coming. I also want to acknowledge the Southworth family. Thanks, thanks to all of you for coming here from across the state. And then we have, on our right, we have a whole group from the Future Farmers of America from the Hood River Valley High School. So thanks for joining us today and look forward to seeing you again. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Kaiser Permanente, Pope and Talbot Inc., and Shorebank Pacific. We're grateful for their support. I should also mention that uh, all of our events are uh, tape recorded and they're available on audio CD as well as on videotape. So on to our program. For generations, at least since the reforms of the progressive era, America has considered itself as setting the gold standard in the raising, processing, and distribution of our food supply. The rest of the world looked to us for ideas about how to assure a safe, nutritious, and affordable food supply. Since the Canadian mad cow story broke last December, however, it almost seems like the American way of life has gone a, undergone a fundamental challenge. After all, if you can't eat a hamburger, what can you eat? And if American food is not safe, what becomes of the whole agricultural sector of our economy? It's fitting that our discussion today about food safety takes place during uh, National Agriculture Week, which is this week, and I think National Agriculture Day is on Saturday. And our two speakers today bring a lifetime of experience with the issues associated with American food and American food safety. Dr. Andrew Clark has been our state veterinarian for most of the period from 1996. He was trained in veterinary medicine at Michigan State University and then spent nine years in the Peace Corps in Africa and uh, also did contracting work uh, in rural development in Tanzania and other parts of East Africa. He joined the Oregon Department of Agriculture in 1973 and after five years in Pendleton and another seven years back in East Africa, he rejoined, he rejoined the Department of Agriculture in 1984 and he's been, uh, again, acting either uh, the acting, the 
state veterinarian, or currently he's acting state veterinarian. Our second speaker, Jack Southworth, and his wife, Teresa, own and operate Southworth Brothers Ranch. Their operation is a cow-calf yearling ranch uh, located on the south side of the Strawberry Mountains near the town of Seneca. The ranch was homesteaded by the Southworth family uh, in 1885 and has been operated by the family ever since. Uh, Jack Southworth is a founding member of Oregon Country Beef and helped draft beef production standards for the Food Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization that promotes sustainable agriculture. Teresa and Jack graduated from Oregon State University together in 1977, married the next year, and have been operating the ranch ever since. Jack Southworth is president of the Grant County Farm Bureau, serves as the director of the Blue Mountain Hospital, the Oregon Agriculture, uh, Agricultural Education Foundation, the E.R. Jackman Foundation, and the Blue Mountain Healthcare Foundation. Thank you. Let's see. We're going to speak first, Dr. Southworth. Dr. Well, good afternoon to you, and thank you for a very delicious lunch. Very much appreciated. I have been asked to talk today about BSE and about food safety, and it's a delight to have the opportunity to come and visit with you and share some ruminations about cows, so to speak. <laughs> I'm the acting state veterinarian at the Oregon Department of Agriculture. And when I mention that title, people sometimes look confused and say, state veterinarian, what does that mean? I thought veterinarians work on dogs and cats and horses and cows. Well, the state veterinarian is generically called the chief animal health official of the state and is responsible for basically three functions. One is control of epizootic diseases, ones that move through an animal population similar to an epidemic in humans. We also deal with the animal end of zoonotic diseases, those that are transmissible between animals and humans. And we're responsible for emergency preparedness should there be either accidental or intentional introduction of a foreign or exotic animal disease that would cause serious health concerns or economic harm. In terms of food safety, the animal health program at ODA and practicing veterinarians who work with both individual animal and herd health management deal with an animal before it becomes a food product. As and after it becomes a food product, a variety of other federal and state regulatory agencies like the Food Safety Infe Inspection Service, FSIS, the Food and, uh, food and Drug Administration, and the Oregon Department of Agriculture Food Safety Division play roles in ensuring the safety of food product as it wends its way through the processing and distribution systems to the consumer. In a quick overview of U.S. food production cycle, the first point is the food grown or raised on the farm. The USDA has a set of recommended standards called good agricultural practices. These are designed to assure that food is safe as it leaves the farm gate. Some growers and producers follow additional voluntary programs defined by buyer standards or private business agreements or by third party certification, such as the Food Alliance or the USDA National Organic Program for which Oregon Tilth is a certifier. From the farm, the next point is typically a packer or a processor where food is prepared for wholesale distribution or for retail sale. The product is cleaned or washed, sorted for size and quality, and packaged. Beef is harvested, divided into primal cuts, and shipped onto the grocery store or food service firm for cutting and wrapping. FDA good manufacturing practices during processing and transportation ensure that the food is properly processed and stored. Meat processors and packers are inspected by USDA Food Safety Inspection Service. Other food processors are checked by the FDA or by Oregon Department of Agriculture inspectors to ensure adherence to those good manufacturing practices. And additionally, the ODA Food Safety Division regulates retail stores, dairy processors, and the shellfish industry and any other part of the system not covered by other agencies. The next stop is retail, grocery stores, restaurants, and institutional food services 
who must also follow foods, safe food handling practices during distribution and preparation for the consumer as dictated by the FDA National Model Food Code, which is absorbed and adopted into Oregon law. These are also inspected by the ODA Food Safety Division one to four times annual at retail, and there are about 8,500 licenses for various retail th things that are s inspected by ODA Food Safety, and in the case of restaurants, at least twice annually by county public health agencies. The last stop is the car or the kitchen of the consumer, and while these two venues are not formally inspected, there are recommended standards of food handling provided to consumers by the retailer, the USDA through state commodity commissions, and by the Oregon State University Extension Service, home economics and health classes in schools, and through ODA and public health department programs and information services. Parallel to the standard production systems, a phenomenon exploding in Oregon and elsewhere is farmers markets fresh food straight from the farm with fun and entertainment too. A delightful way to spend some time on a Saturday morning. The ODA Food Safety Division is working with the Oregon Farmers Market Association to develop guidelines and strategies to ensure food safety at farmers markets. So as you can see throughout the food production and processing system, various standards and safeguards are in place, enforced by federal, state, and county programs. No system is without faults. There are imperfections and there are errors. But food production is in an immense industry, and as a rule, it works very well for us, I think. And now to BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. It's very topical these days, and surely an interesting situation for all of us. Livestock producers and processors, animal disease control specialists, and consumers alike. And it fits more or less into all three of those categories that the state veterinarian works with, epizootics, zoonotics, and emergency preparedness. Let's go over the disease quickly, especially its incidence. And as we do so, it's important to keep in mind that the United States, in the United States, we have never had an indigenous case of either BSE in cattle or its human counterpart, variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. That is critical to remember during our discussion. Now first, I'm not going to use the term mad cow disease. I don't like that term because it creates an inaccurate image of the condition. Mad tends to infer that the cow is crazy or angry or has rabies like a mad dog, and none of these apply. So I'll be using the term BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is an accurate descriptor. Bovine because it affects cattle. Spongiform because a microscopic section, section of the affected brain tissue appears like a sponge. It has voids similar to the pattern of your sponge. And encephalopathy, combining encephalo, the Greek term for brain, and pathy referring to a disease-producing condition, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or BSE. So, never again in this presentation will you hear the term mad cow disease <laughs> escape my lips. <laughs> in cattle, the disease is a slowly developing disorder that causes destruction of brain tissue, leading to specific behavior changes in coordination and eventually death. The causative agent is believed to be a prion, an abnormally shaped specific protease resistant protein. Prions have no DNA or RNA. They have the ability to induce normal protease resistant proteins to fold abnormally, accumulating in locations like the brain where they produce the sponge-like holes of the disease. Researchers on prions and their role in disease have been awarded two Nobel Prizes, but there are still significant gaps in our knowledge of these agents and the disease which they cause, especially in the intermediate stages. We are early in our understanding, but lots of research is being done by very competent science, scientists around the world. BSE is not transmitted from cow to cow like a contagious disease. It is transmitted by eating feed contaminated with the disease-causing prion. 
And therefore, keeping prions out of cattle feeds is a major way to prevent the spread of this disease. BSE is in a family of diseases known as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, or TSEs, which affect several species of animals and humans. With the one exception of BSE, the prions causing disease in one species are not known to cause disease naturally in other species. In addition to BSE, there are two TSE, transmissible spongiform encephalopathy diseases of primary and special interest to us. These are sporadic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or sporadic CJD, and variant or new variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, and that is the form associated with BSE. Sporadic CJD was described independently by Dr. Creutzfeldt and Dr. Jakob in the 1920s. Today we realize it occurs throughout the world at a rate of about one case per million people. The prion disease occurs among vegetarians and meat eaters alike. According to the Centers for Disease Control, there are between 200 and 280 cases of sporadic CJD every year in the United States in line with the worldwide incidence of one case per approximately one million people. Now, new variant CJD was first described in 1995 in the United Kingdom. It is unfortunate that researchers use the old name Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease to describe this new disease because it has created some confusion. Variant CJD and sporadic CJD are very different in all ways of measuring, including the signs of the disease, the age and rapidity of onset, and the prion which causes it. The prion causing variant CJD is indistinguishable from the prion that causes BSE in cows. People are believed to have contracted the disease by consuming BSE-contaminated foods like cattle brain, sausage, and meat pies popular in the UK. The manner in which these products were prepared at the time allowed some brain or spinal cord tissue to be included in these food products. That is no longer the case now. Since the first case described, the first 10 cases were described in 1995, there have been a total in the UK of 146 confirmed and probable variant CJD cases in a population of about 60 million people. This relatively small number of cases is remarkable in light of the fact that more than 160,000 cows were diagnosed with BSE between 1985 and 1996. The incidence of variant CJD in the United Kingdom has averaged about one case per four million people since 19, each year since 1995. The US Centers for Disease Control estimated in 2003 that the risk for acquiring variant CJD from eating beef products was one case per 10 billion beef meals served one case per 10 billion beef meals. By comparison, and in light of the fact that there has never been an indigenous case of either BSE or variant CJD in the United States, the risk to US citizens must be infinitesimal if it can be calculated at all. We've been actively looking for BSE in the United States since 1993 in a targeted surveillance program on cattle showing signs of neurologic disease, including downers. Since 2002, the design of the surveillance program has been to detect a rate of one case per million cattle population with a confidence rate of 95%. On Monday of this week, March 15th, Secretary of Agriculture Ann Veneman announced a new surveillance plan for detection of BSE in U.S. cattle at a rate as low as one case per 10 million cattle. That rate, one in 10 million, is equal to five cows out of the estimated 45 million cows in the U.S. cattle population. The new plan will include testing of cattle on farms as well as cattle who do not enter the food uh, chain and are being rendered. This is designed as a massive one-time push to determine if we do or if we do not have BSE in the United States. It is a program of specific surveillance 
and is not intended as either a trade enhancement or a public health program, although it seems apparent that there are implications for both. Additionally, a national livestock identification system is being initiated, which will identify, anim identify animals and allow traceability of movements and back to the farm of origin. This will be of great assistance for both emergency control, disease control, and for food safety. And now for the sake of comparison and for your assessment of relative risk, consider some normal risks in relation to the BSE risk. Now how about the guy who slams down his fist on the table and he says, I'll never eat beef again, and then lights up his 15th cigarette of the day, finishes off his third beer, jumps in his vehicle and goes boring down the freeway at 75 miles an hour between two trucks. Or how about someone walking across a street in any, virtually any city, including Portland? Or a person walking down a flight of stairs? Or somebody eating a pretzel while watching a football game? <laughs> or any of the many activities in our lives wherein we are taking significant risks and driving on ice comes to mind just now considering our recent winter. But those are normal risks, aren't they? And we really don't give them much consideration. Flu-associated deaths in the United States stand at somewhere around 35,000 annually. Car crashes, 115 people daily. Cell phone-related car crashes kill about 1,600 annually. Use of alcohol and tobacco account for tens of thousands of deaths and millions of disrupted lives. But all of these are legal, accepted, and normal in our daily lives. Even drowning in the bathtub kills hundreds of people every year. Stacked up against this carnage, the BSE risk seems relatively quite small, especially in light of the fact that, again, in the United States, we have never had an indigenous case of either BSE in cattle or variant CJD in humans. So is there real risk with this BSE thing, and does our reaction make sense? Are we acting rationally? In the broad sense of food safety and security, I think, yes, we are. In this particular case, the risk may be mostly subjective perception and objectively extremely low. But the expectation of being able to have confidence in our food supply, both in quantity and quality, is something that Americans take very, very seriously. And so do our food producers and regulatory agencies, of which I am a part of the Oregon Department of Agriculture. Our recent episode of BSE in December and January is an example of both what we can do very well and right and an exercise in pointing out some weaknesses in our system. First, the cow in Washington was identified as having BSE and tracing was, un was undertaken to determine the source of the cow, which we all know uh, turned out to be Canada. An emergency disease control task force was formed using the incident command system the ICS system is standard, the standard organizing principle for nationally for most emergencies of any sort and is the basis of the response plans of Oregon Emergency Management, which is our state agency. The incident command post was in Yakima and all the elements for epidemiology, sample collection and diagnosis, appraisal and indemnity, surveillance, cleaning and disinfection and so on were headquartered there. State and federal personnel were summoned to the scene to deal with the many aspects of tracing animal movement, investigating farms where animals of interest might be, identification of animals who might be involved, killing and sample, uh, sampling of those who were determined to be at risk, and so on. Meat products from the affected animal were traced for recall purposes, and national and state administrators dealt with media, producer groups, other governments, and international animal disease control organizations. In Oregon, we inv inventoried all relevant identification on about 24,000 cattle in six days, an average of 4,000 head per day. For those of you who have worked with cattle, you will recognize that's a pretty significant average for handling cattle on a daily basis, indicating good workers, good organization, and excellent cooperation from the part of the cattle owners. We found one trace animal and 19 so-called animals of interest who may be involved. 
All of these were killed, tested, and found negative. Similar activities were undertaken with similar results in Washington and in Idaho. The International Special Subcommittee analyzing the incident made several policy recommendations to the USDA. One, reduce public health risk for consumer protection. Two, limit recycling and amplification of the agent. Three, establish the level of effectiveness of measures through surveillance. Four, prevent any inadvertent introduction of BSE from abroad in the future. And five, contribute to the prevention of the spread of the epidemic worldwide. Much of this is in place as we speak. Now on the bright side, we were fortunate to have our first real test of our animal disease response system, emergency response system in Oregon happen with a disease that's not transmitted from cow to cow. We essentially had a hyper-realistic exercise. The ICS system worked well, the field operation went smoothly, and field level, level cooperation between agencies was excellent. But we also learned that we need work on communications with our highly placed federal counterparts. And we discovered the limitations of our ability to recall products involved in a rapidly occurring inc incident where food safety is a concern. Our governor has written to Secretary of Agriculture addressing these concerns. Long-term interventions have been in place for years to prevent the introduction of BSE into the United States. In 1989, both live cattle and cattle-based food products from the United Kingdom were banned. 1989, that's a ways back. We have continued to ban cattle and cattle products from countries where BSE has been diagnosed, most re including most recently Canada. In 1997, feeding of certain mammalian protein products to cattle, sheep, and goats was banned to eliminate the possibility that any BSE-contaminated material might expose these animals. In Oregon, our feeds program at ODA monitors animal feeds manufacturing and labeling practices and performs inspection of feed mills on behalf of FDA <clears throat> Excuse me, to ensure that the rules are being followed. Beef quality assurance, or BQA, programs are a standard and significantly increasing part of cattle production, supported and funded by producer groups and government agencies. An extensive BQA program funded through a grant from the FSIS and FDA has been undertaken by Oregon State University, the Extension Service. These programs address all levels of management in both cow and calf to ensure high-quality, residue-free, healthy, and wholesome beef. Copies of the Oregon program, which is this booklet, are available if you would like one to see the details. Last month, significant new national rules have been enacted. Non-ambulatory or downer cows may no longer enter the human food chain. Specified risk materials, including all brain and spinal cord associated tissues from animals over 30 months of age, are prohibited from entering the food chain. Air injection stunning at time of slaughter is prohibited, and a variety of other inventions, uh, I'm sorry, interventions are in process in response to the International Subcommittee report. We've done a lot of background work to prevent the incursion of BSE. We've handled the recent incident quite well in the short run. And in process of doing so, we've learned some shortcomings in our systems that are highlighted for action, some of which has already been undertaken. I don't want to be thought of as unduly minimizing the situation, but for those who have the impression that we are facing an imminent and large-scale epidemic, I think the numbers and the preventive strategies in place should be reassuring. Food safety is a sensitive and important issue for each of us, and we all want good feeds for ourselves and for the animals we consume. Our evolutionary destiny as single-stomached omnivores means that we're designed to eat a wide variety of virtually everything, plant and animal alike, in moderation, and we like to have our foods come to us clean and healthy. But it's imperative that we recognize that we live in a world of dynamic biology and continuous evolution, including pathogenic microorganisms and now prions. A few years ago, recall, E. coli 0157H7, HIV AIDS, 
BSE and prions were unknown. We're all learning and generating responses to this flow of nature, the food production community, the medical community, and the regulatory community alike. Our system is imperfect, but like biology, it is dynamic and changing to address contemporary realities. And I think it critical that as we do so, we retain an atmosphere of good analysis, sound research, fair criticism, and responsible and reasonable reaction. Many thanks for the opportunity to come here today, and I'm delighted to turn over the podium to Jack Southworth. Good afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure and indeed an honor to address the Portland City Club and also Hood River FFA. Um, I don't want to appear glib or trivial, but let me start off by saying that while I empathize with the people and businesses that have been affected by the discovery of a cow with BSE in Washington State, I think BSE may be a good thing for our society. The reason I say that, it's a good wake-up call that we don't want to manipulate with too heavy a hand the natural cycles and processes that grow our food. Cattle by nature are ruminants that eat forages. Without BSE and that warning, that wake-up call, how far would industry have pushed them towards being carnivores before saying enough? I think BSE is a symptom of a larger problem. I think for too long, our industry didn't ask you, the consumer, what you wanted. And I think for too long, our industry has rewarded quantity rather than quality. I'm not going to tell you today that another cow without BSE will never be found in the United States. I'm going to tell you that the beef you eat, wherever you buy it, is a very safe food that is getting even safer thanks to the actions of Dr. Clark and others. And while I agree with Dr. Clark that we need to put the risk of BSE in perspective, I'm not going to tell you that eating beef is safer than driving your car, because that is not the way you should think about your food. You should not have to assess risk factors with each bite you take. Eating should be an enjoyable, thankful experience. While we need to think about what and how much we eat, Fear and statistical risk should not be a part of that experience. The food you eat is more than your own nourishment. Each item you purchase is a vote. With that vote, you help decide what brands and types of food succeed and fail. With that vote, you impact our regional economy. And you even impact our environment by either selecting foods that are raised sustainably or those that deplete our ecosystem. As our food choices increase, you have a greater say as to how your food is, gr is grown. To ensure the safety of our food, there are things the government should do, there are things producers should do, and there are things that you as consumers should be doing. In the end, food safety is not just about freedom from disease-causing organisms. It's also about the economic safety of restaurants and grocery stores and cattle ranches. And it's about the social safety of an Oregon that has rural and, e and urban economies that are both thriving. First, let's talk about what the government is doing to ensure the safety of our beef. It's good that downer cows are no longer allowed in our food supply. An animal that can't walk, whether by injury or disease, is not good food, and I can't conceive of a humane way that a down animal could be transported. They should be put down on the dairies or ranches they are on, rendered and composted or recycled. It was a surprise to me, other ranches and quite a few dairymen, that down cows were being used in the food supply at all, because the transportation of down cows had been out loud outlawed in Oregon for several years. Downer cows were a very small number of animals 
that were butchered. But that number should have been and is now zero. A side benefit of banning those downer cows is that it will cause more humane treatment of cattle and the sale of healthier livestock. If the value of a down cow is zero or a negative value and the value of a walking cow is several hundred dollars, it will be in the best interest of everyone to sell sounder, healthier livestock. All of our beef animals should be strict vegetarians. If a feed is derived from something that once had a heartbeat, it should not be fed to a cow. All ruminant derived feeds are banned in the United States and have been since 1997. They should be. A ruminant's role is to digest forages and convert them to manure and urine that benefit the fertility of soils. Beef production should be about cattle on well-managed pasture and rangelands and not about the recycling of animal byproducts. Poultry litter, for example, is for soil. It's not a cow feed. What hasn't been done yet and needs to be implemented is a permanent individual identification system for all breeding animals, cows and bulls, in the United States. Non-breeding animals do not need to be identified as they are processed into beef before 20 months of age. And BSE nowhere in the world has been detected in an animal that young. But there needs to be a way of permanently identifying breeding animals that often live 12 to 15 years of age. In the event of a disease outbreak, permanent ID will aid in the rapid tracking and checking of herd mates and quicker understanding of where the disease originated or might be located. It is estimated that it will cost $100 million to enact such a program. The Bush administration's new budget has allocated $30 million. As a consumer, your world has changed. As I said earlier, it used to be no one asked your opinion. Now everyone does. So what can you as a consumer do to make beef safer? Get closer to your source. In the end, by your purchasing decisions, you dictate what is sold in the marketplace. 20 years ago, when it came to protein, you didn't have many choices. You could decide to purchase beef, pork, chicken, or even tofu. But beef was beef, all USDA graded and inspected, but no differentiation of product except by cut. You had no idea where it was grown or how it was grown, and neither did your meat cutter. Today, you can choose lean or prime, antibiotic-free or generic, corn-fed or grass-fed, fresh, organic, or dry-aged. Stores and restaurants are constantly seeking an edge in attracting customers. Your purchasing decisions dictate what will be sold. Tell your meat cutter or your favorite chef the kind of beef you want, and that will send signals to the distributor, the packer, the feedlot, and all the way back to the ranch. Seek out branded beef. That is beef that has a trademark label on it, giving it an identity. This label gives you a contact where you can ask questions about how the beef is raised. Painted Hills, Oregon Country Beef, and Coleman's are examples of branded beef products. If you want beef that is raised on grass only, there are brands you can buy. If you want beef that was raised in the Pacific Northwest, you can do it. And your dollars will stay right here benefiting our local economies. It is easy for me to say that most of you should get more knowledgeable about the beef you buy. But you are busy people. You want safe food that has been produced sustainably, but you don't want to spend half your life researching what food meets your standards. You might consider using a certifier like Food Alliance. They are a third-party certification organization that labels foods that have been raised in a safe, humane, and ecologically sustainable manner. They are to food what underwriter laboratories are to electrical appliances. Food with a Food Alliance label is food grown right. Another example of closing the gap between consumer and producer is the farmer-chef connection put on by Ecotrust for the last four years. 
This year, 215 farmers and chefs got together in Canby. And according to an article in the Capitol Press, Paul Bepler, the chef right here at the MAC, has participated in the event every year. He estimates he has increased the amount of food purchased from local farmers from 10% of his total to nearly half. I said that 20 years ago, you didn't have many choices when it came to beef. That was also true for the rancher. There were different feedlots, true for the rancher when it came to sell as beef. There were different feedlots who would buy cattle and several packers who bought from the feedlots. But in reality, there was only one market. That meant we were commodity producers. In order, in order to succeed, we had to produce the maximum number of pounds at the lowest possible cost. That mentality leads to growth implants, feed additive antibiotics, the feeding of animal byproducts, and stress throughout the system. For a rancher, it is a lonely, depressing, spirit-killing feeling to have the bids on your animals be below the cost of production. Today, with the branding of products, we can get paid for quality rather than just quantity. We can get a premium for not using growth implants and antibiotics. We can develop a relationship with the consumer rather than just handing our cattle over to the next link in the chain of production. However, with the branding of beef also comes accountability. Beef can be now traced all the way back to the ranch it comes from. Accountability forces us all to do a better job. There is no place to hide, and there shouldn't be. In his book, New Roots for Agriculture, Wes Jackson writes, and I quote, nature is at once uncompromising and forgiving. But we do not precisely know the degree of her compromise, nor the extent of her forgiveness. I frankly doubt that we ever will. But we can say with a rather high degree of certainty that if we are to heal the split between man and nature, it is the human agricultural system which must grow more toward the ways of nature rather than the other way around." Unquote. That is good news for all of us. In a commodity agricultural system, the victory goes to the largest and the cheapest. Our farms become factories, and while their food safety is regulated, their values are not examined. In a quality-based agricultural system, ranches like ours that are family-sized operations can compete. It is easier for smaller operations to not use antibiotics, to avoid the implants, to never use animal byproducts as feeds, and to work towards a goal that includes society and the ecosystem as well as a profit. That means for the first time, Oregon farms and ranches can compete and prosper on a long-term basis. Big, low-cost operations will continue to do well. They should. Our country's population is within shouting distance of 300 million people. They all need to be fed, and people like Andrew and the Oregon Department of Agriculture will make sure they do it safely. But the nice thing about 300 million people is that there are niches that organizations like Oregon Country Beef can fill that will provide some measure of economic sustainability for Oregon ranches. 30 or 40 years ago, as consumers, you were never asked if you wanted poultry litter and blood meal fed to cattle. That decision was left to the nutritionists, who were hired to produce beef at the lowest possible cost so that ranchers could lower their production costs and stay in business for another year. When a relationship is established between the consumer and the producer, the question of how you want your beef produced is constantly being asked. You have an opportunity to buy beef grown the way you want, and family ranches in Oregon have a chance to stay in business. As beef producers, we were once told that, competing, that we were competing against pork and chicken, that the American consumer would always be, buy the least expensive meat. That helped fuel the belief that it was okay to feed animal byproducts. But you know what? 
You can't hardly raise a pig or a chicken without confinement facilities and the use of processed feeds. With beef, we can utilize forages and grains as nature prepares them. They don't need to be housed, and with a little knowledge and skill, we don't need to use antibiotics or growth hormones. We were finally learning that beef ought to be beef. In closing, as a producer of some of the beef that you might eat, here's my wish. That the beef you eat comes from farms and ranches owned by families that have been on the land for generations. Where old men putter, children play, and the work is done well for the present and the future. That when you be eat beef, it comes from land where the rain and snow soaks into the grass and then into the soil and leaves slowly as clear year-round creeks that are good habitat for fish and beaver. That the beef you eat comes from pastures and rangelands, managed well, that are good habitat for cattle and coyotes, for sage grouse and salmon, for horsemen and hikers. That when you visit the rangelands of the Pacific Northwest, it is a pleasure for you to see the land, breathe the air, and talk with people who love where they live. That the small towns you never heard of have schools that are still open. That teach kids who go on to college and come back home again. That the beef you eat comes from cattle that were handled gently, treated with respect, who are adapted to their environment and have never known sickness. And I want you to taste all of that with every bite you take. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew and Jack. Um, as you know, City Club members have the privilege of asking questions of our uh, speakers, but I'd like to extend that also to our visitors from Hood River Valley High School. So if you'd like to ask questions, please feel free to as well. Our first question, though, will come from our board host, Chris Smith. He's been a City Club member since 1991, and he's a lead internet technologist for the Xerox Office Group. He also chairs our City Club Advocacy Committee. And following uh, uh, Chris's question, we'll open up the mic to other uh, uh, to City Club members and our uh, Hood River High School guests. Please uh, come to the mics while Chris is uh, making, uh, speaking his question. And when it uh, comes to your turn, please identify yourself as a club member or high school, uh, Hood River High School member and ask your question. And please remember a question ends in a question mark and, and please make your question in 30 seconds or less. Thank you. Well, this program, timely as it is, is actually also a great segue to something that City Club is working on for later in the year. I have the pleasure of being part of a small group from City Club and an organization called Slow Food that's working on a series on food policy that will look at the policy implications of how our food is produced from what it means for Oregon's economy to how it impacts our transportation systems uh, to what it means for our health. So uh, watch your bulletins. You'll see more about another Friday forum and then an evening series where we'll also get to sample some of Oregon great products uh, while we examine those policy issues. Uh, I'd like to push a little more on the traceability question. Um, you know, I understand uh, Dr. Clark's argument about the numbers and uh, why I should probably pay more attention to looking both ways before I cross the street than to worrying about uh, where the meat I eat comes from. Um, but I've noticed that since the BSE outbreak, my partner, whenever we go to the restaurant, invariably asks the question, where did the cow come from? Uh, and I think people now have it on their radar screen, uh, and it's going to be of great interest. And uh, knowing I was going to be uh, asking the first question here today, uh, as I was reading Wired Magazine, the March issue, I couldn't help noticing this article, The Transparent Burger. And it suggests that in our future, you'll be able to scan the label from your package of ground beef into your computer and get uh, a genetic history of the cow, how it was fed, where it was processed, and it goes on to say that this technology is actually already being brought to fruition in Japan. Um, so Dr. Clark, you talked about uh, the national identification system. Jack, you talked about branding, but also suggested that animals younger than 20 months don't need to be specifically identified. I guess I wonder if that's true, if, if consumers like my partner 
aren't going to care, even though uh, you know, the numbers may say that that's not an issue. So uh, what can we look for in the way of uh, pass through to plate traceability, both what the government may drive and what the marketplace may drive? There is a, a plan for a national identification system for cattle and other livestock as well, but cattle will be the first group who are so identified that will allow for tracing uh, through the movements of the animal through the food production system and back to the ranch or farm of origin. Uh, this plan is scheduled to begin the first phases of the premises identification system this year. Uh, there is still some uh, discussion going on about exactly how it will be implemented, but I think that uh, without doubt a national identification system will take place. This is not only in relation to BSE, but in relation to other diseases as well, especially emergency diseases that we may encounter. For example, foot and mouth disease. If we had an epizootic, it would be imperative to be able to trace animal movements. It also has implications for food safety and management uh, in that a spin-off of being able to have individual ID allows producers to have quality uh, involved programs as well, uh, not associated with the government program of traceability, but it allows them to do uh, enhancement uh, sort of programs for the quality of their product. I would add that if you bought a, a cut of Oregon country beef and didn't like it and wanted to know about the history of it, you could go back to the store and they could uh, see what box came from Washington beef. That box would have a label on it. Washington beef could tell the day when that animal was processed. Depending on the day that animal was processed, we could tell you the four or five or six ranches cattle that were processed on that particular day. And um, we can't go to the exact ranch, but we could get it down to a handful of ranches so that the, the, uh, if you want to inspect standards of production, you could, uh, you could get a grasp on it. Bill Savage, City Club member, and first of all, thank you very much, both of you, for your real helpful presentations. Um, question for Dr. Clark. Uh, is there any possibility of being able to test for BSE before killing a cow? In answer to a, a live animal test, at this point, there is none. However, today it was announced that the rapid, two rapid screening tests uh, have been approved by USDA, and these will be the tests that are used in the uh, surveillance program that I mentioned. Uh, they allow very quick testing. I think the one of them takes only four hours, and thus animals who are tested will not be released into the food supply until the test comes back negative. Any animal positive, of course, would go on for further testing. Essentially, there are three tests to be used. One is the rapid screening test, which is intentionally oversensitive, so it would pick up any possibility of a positive. The other tests are then used to, to refine and to be more specific uh, as to whether or not there is actual a B, actually a BSE uh, in, uh, infection involved. What about irrid irradiation? A lot of things. Uh, irradiation is a technology that is fairly recent. Uh, I have had a question about whether or not irradiation, being able to kill many microorganisms, would cause the processors to kind of slack off and not exercise the vigilance that they should. I think that would not be the case. The processors are uh, being very careful in terms of the cleanliness and sanitation they use to reduce contamination, and that is being confirmed by the inspectors. Irradiation is a very good, in my view, supplement to assist with uh, further reduction of pathogenic microorganisms, especially bacteria. It has been developed uh, partially in response to the E. coli 0157H7 situation, and is a developing technology, not yet widely used, but it certainly has some very good potentials. 
I agree that uh, irradiation may solve the problem. It also creates a false atmosphere of security. Um, recently, there was an article about people that drove SUVs. People that drive SUVs are in more accidents and cause more accidents than people that drive Honda Accords. They have a false sense of security, and I'd hate to create that. Uh, food should be treated well. And Dr. Press, a City Club member, a question for Jack Southworth. You uh, uh, stated a, a very well a uh, possibility of tracing cuts of beef, and, and, I, and I understand that, and that's good. But uh, I, an article in the Oregonian some time ago said that uh, if you eat in the ordinary rapid food place like McDonald's and so on, let's say three or four hamburgers a month, that those hamburgers could be coming from perhaps a half a dozen or a score of cattle, and maybe here and in Canada or in other countries. In other words, more than one country, many cattle. Uh, my wife says, if you want hamburgers, let's buy a cut of meat and have them grind it. Do you have any comments on the traceability uh, and the, pot the relative risk hazard of eating hamburgers in a, in a uh, Mac McDonald's, for example, versus in, uh, in a, uh, a piece of beef that you had to butcher grind? Um, first of all, the, the larger the organization that you're buying your beef from, they have to handle huge quantities of beef. And to trace it back to a specific source would be very, very difficult. So um, secondly, I think the meat that is at McDonald's, and McDonald's has been a, done a tremendous job of enforcing, enforcing stringent standards. I think it would be very safe. So while it's harder to trace back in a large organization, it is still very safe. Um, the smaller the uh, company you're buying from, the easier it is to trace back. The closer you get to the producer, the easier it is to trace back. But simply being able to trace back doesn't mean that it's any safer. Um, hamburger is, is, is tricky stuff. Hamburger has lots of surface on it. So bacteria has lots of opportunities to get on it and stay on it. If you buy a steak, there's only uh, three dimensions on it, and uh, you can clean those and keep them cold, and the bacteria can't get inside it. So yes, you can, uh, you can be safe grinding your own meat. Do I think it's necessary? Hardly. Excuse me, could I, could I make a comment in regards to your, uh, to your question? Um, one, in terms of hamburger, that is one of the points at which there is definitely a consumer responsibility to cook the product properly. And the recommended temperature by the Food Safety Division at ODA is an internal temperature of at least 155 degrees or until there is no pinkness left. Uh, secondly, you mentioned an article in the Oregonian. I would like to say that uh, in preparing for this presentation, I reviewed a number of articles from the Oregonian, and I must say that I think Oregonians must be the most well-informed people about this whole situation in the entire United States. Um, Guinevere Milius, City Club member. My question has less to do with the product that gets in the meat uh, that might get into your hamburger from the brain and more what comes out of the other end of the cow that sometimes get in, gets into hamburger. Um, I uh, have read the book Fast Food Nation. I know it's very controversial among uh, the cattle industry, this particular book. But you know, there's someone that's quoted in that book who says, uh, it doesn't matter if you cook your hamburger completely, you still have manure in your meat. And it's, whether it's cooked completely or not, it's still there. Can you talk at all about the rules that FDA has in place to keep, keep national large-scale slaughterhouses clean and how well those rules are being enforced. I understand that the rules are there, but that backing up that system hasn't really been in place. Can you talk about that at all? <laughs> yes, I would be happy to address that. The, I think what you're referring to, the potential fecal contamination of a carcass, when the E. coli 0157H7 situation developed, and that is a fecal contaminant, 
there was a lot of work done in that regard to address that concern. Is there contamination taking place, and if so, how? And what can be done about it? Lots of work was done. Uh, one of the things that was found is that as the hide is cut, hair may curl in and touch the surface of the carcass. Surface contamination is where it starts, and so steps were taken to address that issue, including washing the carcass after the skinning had taken place with something like citric acid so as to reduce that sort of contamination. Uh, irradiation is another potential of the interventions that can be done at that point. And throughout the system of the slaughtering and processing of beef, there are HACCP points, the hazard analysis and critical control point system is in effect, where any time there's kind of a choke point in that system and it can be addressed, they are doing so. There is, I think, a sharp reduction in the number of E. coli 0157 cases associated with meat in the last couple of years from what it was previously. There's been a lot of work done in that regard. There's no excuse for fecal contamination of a carcass, I thoroughly uh, agree, uh, but there have also been many interventions since that was determined to be a problem. We've run out of time, but let's have one last question. Yes. Thank you. Um, my question is that um, the, pr the prion that causes mad cow disease, or BSE, how did, this, how did it come about, where, and how long has it been around? Do you have the dates in mind, Jeff? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> if I recall correctly, the first human case variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease was defined, I think, in 1985. And the first BSE case, I think, in 1976. My understanding of how it developed was that there was a change in the rendering system in the UK from either a chemical extraction to a heat extraction process or the reverse, and I'm sorry, I can't tell you accurately which. And there was some involvement there that allowed the prion to be retained and to become problematic. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, before you leave, are you from Hood River? I am. Are you headed to the FFA State Convention? Yeah, that's where we're all headed. And how many of you are, you, are going to compete? Good luck. Yes. So maybe with that, with uh, some applause and some good luck to our Hood River High School students, we say. We're